Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 179 for Monday, August 27th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast you know by foreign about working musicians. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And out here in California, Los Gatos, California, that is Paul Kent. How you doing, my friend? Doing pretty good, man. I had a busy weekend, and I definitely have a tale of woe to share. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, yeah. yeah. I had. Uh, I also had a busy weekend. I don't have any tales of woe to share, but I have many. <laughs> I have many tales to share. You want to? You want to? Uh, you want to open things up with your woeing, woeing tale? I do. So uh, my woeing tale might have a happy ending. So let me just kind of put that out there Great. to start the story. But we played a show at a venue. That a venue has been around for a long time. It was a really loved venue. It's a cool room, cool size room, great sound. Um, but it's under new ownership that is making some pretty drastic changes to the, to the way the place is run. Sure. It's a restaurant and a, and a music room. Um, and, uh, well, I guess I'll just start and say that we get communication a few days before the gig from the guy who booked us there. And I should say, this is a ticketed event. So oh, we get that's paid. Right. This was the, the one, right. Yes. In the, yep. in a town, uh, not too close to where you're, you're from, right? Yes. That, this is the one you talked about. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Context set. Thank you. Yeah. Context set. So, uh, we got a, a note, uh, Wednesday, the week of our Saturday event and saying, you know, we'd like sound check to be three over by five. And we didn't have downbeat till eight. So that is tremendously inconvenient. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, it, it's far enough away where it's a hassle to go back home. You know, when you have five hours, three hours between, you know, there's not really anything really to do there for three hours. You know, it's a club date to us. Yeah. I was going to say for, a, for a, like a wedding gig, it, well, that, that happens for any gig where, you know, in advance that that's going to happen, like well in advance, you, you, you factor that into a, what you're doing that day, but also be what you're charging for the gig and the, like the whole thing. And then you just know, yeah, I've got to burn an afternoon. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But when it's a surprise, not so good. So, you know, I bounced it off the guys and, you know, they were roundly disappointed to hear this. And so we agreed, we'll just do a line check like we do at many of our venues. You know, like there are many clubs we play where we can't make a sound till almost downbeat time. Yep. Right. So, yeah, of course. Uh, Mo I yeah, would say so, most most clubs that are restaurants are like that. Yeah, there you, you go. can, you know, you can like carefully check things quietly, like do all the speakers work. Yes. OK, that's enough. You know, then that's it. Yeah. yeah and then you kind of get the mix in the first song type of thing. Yeah, and, right. You know, right. So anyway, we were prepared to do that. So we had said, we'll we'll do a a 730 line check. OK. And, and an 8 p.m. downbeat. So we get to the venue and um, we had sent an advance our stage plot to their sound guy. Uh, the sound guy meets us there and uh, he's not ready. Nothing's ready. And so we get there and, you know, the my drummer and my keyboard player had actually gotten there earlier in the day and set some stuff up and then went off to do some other things. We were totally playing by the rules and, and uh, you know, yeah. it was coming together very, very slowly. Then it turns out that one of the investments the new ownership has made in this place is to put in an, a new board, <laughs> the Behringer board that we've been talking about for, yeah. for a couple of episodes now. Okay. Yeah. So there's a new board. And again, Bill's not wholly familiar with that board. That We talked about that. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yep. I mean, and, 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 uh, ironic because what we, uh, one of the piece of advice we gave was if you're doing this kind of stuff, learn that board because eventually you will run into a scenario where you are going to mix on it. Yep. Yep. And, yep. you know, to further this, one of the previous gigs that we had done, the guy had the board and he saved our settings to, you know, a, a USB drive, oh, gave nice. it to Bill and Bill was expecting to be able to walk in, you know, drop this in, drop in our settings and, you know, further simplify the setup. Anyway, so, you know, we've got a couple things going on. We've and got that, a sound for, guy. For anyone that's not using a digital board yet, right there, that is the one of the biggest advantages you get is that you get to Definitely. show up at a club. And even though you've got to retune the the speakers for the room and the EQ for the room, 
you know, knowing that I've got Paul singing into that mic it is the same in any room. So whatever settings I had for that are going to be that in any right. room. And then you get to sort of season to taste from there. So, yeah. Digital, Theoretically, digital it should save credit. you a lot of time and make make things easier for you. But Theoretically. So remember, we, you know, we have this first thing where uh, this odd request for a way early soundtrack that we passed. And it wasn't a big deal. The, the, the guy who booked us is a musician and he actually transcends the new ownership. He worked for the old ownership as well. So he's been around this building for a while. Got it. He was like, yeah, I get it. Just go ahead and do a, a, a line check. So anyway, we get there. Sound guy had neglected to look at our stage plot was really starting from scratch, starting at seven uh, when we got there. Oh. And uh yeah, so we're going along and you, you can tell that something's not right. And something happened with the board that the, this sound guy didn't know what to do to do about. And so there was a whole bunch of reprogramming inputs and outputs and, and, and assignments that needed to happen. And clearly there was a little bit of dismay going on there. And uh, as we get to about 745 now, and we're still not on stage, even line checking, I walk up to ask the sound guy for an ETA and uh, the owner was just walking away from the sound guy. And clearly they had a conversation. Now the restaurant is there and uh, there, there are a fair number of people in the restaurant. And uh, what the owner had said to the sound guy was, well, if you want to push this to eight forty-five or nine o'clock, he, the owner wouldn't, I, I don't think he, I didn't get the sense that he said, make that happen, but he strongly recommended that happening or, or requested that happening or some, something that put the sound guy in a position where he had to interpret what the owner wanted. Right. 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 But anyway, net net, we're now out to 845 and I'm saying, well, a couple of things here. One, uh, you know, someone should have let me know that someone needs to tell these people who have come in for the show now yeah. that it's going to be starting 45 minutes late. Some of which are our fans that have bought a ticket to see us. Some of which are your patrons that have bought a ticket, you know, because they, you know, support your venue. Yeah. So, and, yeah and this isn't owners, just like a, you know, you're playing in a club or a restaurant or whatever, and it's their night entirely when it's a ticketed thing. There's a lot of shared risk, a shared Absolutely. reward, right? It's a, it does change that the 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 control structure, if you will. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So I started going table to table, and yeah. like I'm I'm basically making a personal assessment. Odd that the owner wouldn't have greeted us, and you know, or someone wouldn't have shown us where there was a green room, evidently, and they didn't show us where the green room was. Odd that the owner wouldn't have talked to me about the delay in time. Odd that the owner isn't walking around talking to his patrons. I, my interpretation is the owner is worried about his dining patrons uh, not being cool because, uh, you know, the restaurant is actually open to the music venue. It's not two separate rooms. Sure. Right. And you're basically all together. Anyway, so I'm starting to get a sense like, all right, we're, you know, we have a we have a challenged communication path here. So, you know, my mode is to try and keep things chill and still get ready to do a gig. So keep the guys chill. And the guys are actually really good about it. They're like, you know, whatever, you know, we'll deal with it. So I asked, you know, can we go late? Because that's the other thing is I don't want to cheat the people who bought a ticket to see us and do a shorter show because the venue wasn't ready for us. Right. And sound guy confirms. Nope. You can go as late as you want. So anyway, they're still working to get some board things done. Poor Bill is on the phone with the uh, the main sound guy for the venue, who's literally walking them through on the phone some fixes to some things. That that board, I will say, assigned. you can route yourself into oblivion with that. Exactly. Board. Yep. Exactly. And I, I've been. I know exactly that scenario because I've been there uh, before, where you, you you know it looks like everything's right, but there's one tiny little needle in the big haystack that's just pointing you know left instead of right. For sure. Yep. Yep. So anyway, 84, 845, we're on stage, we're line checking and nine o'clock, we got to go. And we still don't have things like, you know, balance mixes. I don't have all the vocals in my ears, but you know, there, there was another 20 minutes of, of sound checking to do, but you know, we're like, we got to go. So yeah, no time. Yep. We started the gig at nine, played to about 1115, 1130. And uh, a good time was had by all, I guess, but that's good. The, the end of the story is I sent the guy who booked us, who, again, is a good guy who, who's been with both ownerships. I sent him a note the next morning saying pretty challenged night last night. And the tone was uh, direct, but but uh, understanding. Not disrespectful. Perhaps. Yeah, I wasn't okay. understanding. No, I was like, 
<laughs> yeah. You know, we had a challenge night. <clears throat> the um, the band really wasn't respected very well. Like nobody was communicating to us. Mm. It's not cool that the sound guy wasn't ready for us. We took the time to prep him and send him everything he needed to do to be successful. That's not cool. You know, nobody talked to the patrons except for me. You know, that's disrespecting the patrons, you know. And I said, listen, I get it. You guys are, it's a new ownership and, and you may be trying to get your flow, flow right, but some proper communication would have gone a long way here. So I sent that off pretty much ready to write off the venue. Like, you know, from everything I saw, you know, there were some challenges there that I'm, I'm assuming we're going to be, you know, end of game sooner or later if this sure. continues. Right. Yeah. To the booking guy's credit, he calls me an hour later. He says, hey, man, I got your note. I sincerely appreciate it. I want to talk to you about every point on it. We sat there and we went through every point. He talked about what he could control. He talked about, you know, he's trying to defend music in his town. And, you know, he wants Mm -hmm. to, you know, we want the room to be a success. And he wants the room to be a success. It's his gig, too. So uh, we went through everything. He said, you know, you guys are great. We want you. I want you back. Not we. I want you back. And, you know, we want to get a relationship going. Yes, the bands need to be respected and I need to you know address that. Yes. You know, I took a night off because I haven't had one in a while and I'm regretting doing that. But I agree. You know, our sound team has to have their act together. And uh, yeah, you know, the communication, our owner's a good guy. And, um, you know, this is probably a, a, a personality thing more than, you know, a, 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 than a, than a nefarious thing. Yeah. It's right? not intentional. Right. It felt, it felt hasslish at, in the moment, but you know, sure. in, in the, in the essence. Right. So, and again, from the musician standpoint, you're always prepared to have the weird venue owner, you know, be that a, a confrontational situation, but in reality, you, you have to suss it out every single time to figure you out have, if it is. Or not. You do. And it, it is, I, I'm certainly guilty of this. You know, anytime something goes even a little sideways and it's not immediately addressed from the standpoint of the musicians, you know, it's really easy. Like I said, especially for me, I'll, I'll assume, Oh, these people don't care about bands like the, you know, right. whatever, right. That. And, and then once you have that in your head, even if it's not true at all, it sours the night and can translate out to, you know, the patrons and everything else. And it's really, I I get why successful artists um, have managers that shield them from a lot of that stuff because it's like some of a lot of it's just BS, right? It's just the, the normal crap that goes on. And even though you know that it's the normal crap that goes on, once it's in your head, it impacts your performance in some way, right? Even if you know, I got to get past this, you're, yeah. you're, you're still putting in the effort to get past it as opposed to just walking on stage blissfully unaware, right? And putting on the show of your life. And It's that, so true. You know, I mean, that's the thing is, that's why my rule is even, no matter what's going on with bandmates, no matter what's going on anywhere, it is bliss time when you are at the venue getting ready to perform. We can talk about anything we want afterwards, yep. but in the lead up to a gig, the, the tacit agreement is we're going to hold hands. We're going to chill. We're going to support each other and we're going to go in because, you know, you work too hard to get the gig. You know, it shouldn't be miserable to play the gig. Right. 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 But some, but you know, when, when it, it it's, and you should, I think have that rule as a band. And uh, you know, I, I say that knowing full well that not only have I been in bands where that rule is broken, I've, I'm the one that breaks it sometimes, you know, we're not, no, none of us are perfect. But even when you have that rule and adhere to it, there are the external factors that once they make it in, it's like, oh, well, none of us put this, you know, put this pile of stink here. And yet we're all aware. Look at the stink pile, you know, and then it sucks. Yep. And you got to work to get past it. Yeah. So the lessons in all this are, you know, still you do your homework. Be cautious about what you're going to project onto other people. Like I said, you know, I don't know this owner. And so I was ready to project, Oh, another weird, you know, club owner yeah. where, you know, communication is so vitally important. And, uh, you know, but also I think for the artists, for the musicians, it's okay to draw your line in the sand. So I ended this conversation saying with the, with the booking guy who called me back saying, because he was so cool about it to call me back and very calmly and professionally just talk through the issues That's and own 
own and not deflect, be honest about the stuff that he could or couldn't have an effect on. And, you know, he said, we'd love to get some stuff fixed and let's see if we can figure out something again. And I said, when, when you guys get your flow, right. And when you're, you know, figuring out what you want to do, you know, I'm open to talking, but you know, we're going to talk about these issues again. He goes, absolutely. We're going to, you know, we'll check them off next time we want to cross this bridge. So it, it, I guess communication and checking your emotion, checking yourself is just two, two good things to remember in all situations. Yep. We're very prepared. Again, we got a bill who, who does all the advanced work, who comes with us. He saved the day. If he wasn't there again, you know, this guy who didn't know his own board. This would have been a disaster, right? Oh yeah. And again, a 10 piece band, you know, it is amazing to me. We spend a lot of time trying to get people prepared for us. And, you know, we have five wireless mics. We have, you know, a wireless fire, five wireless horn mics. We often have a wireless vocal mic, two wireless guitars. We have a lot of technology that's all coming together. Yeah. And we tell people in advance, you know, we, you, you have to be prepared for us, have the mic set, you know, have a plan for how you're going to, how are you going to connect us? Right. And it's amazing to me. So few people do. And, and it always, always, takes its toll at the, at the, at the clock. You know, it's, we're always late when people don't prepare for us. Yep. Oh, of course. I, I mean, yeah. How could you not be right? That's yep. it's terrible. Yep. So anyway, a, a mildly optimistic ending to the story, a tough situation, but again, here, here's a real rainbow for it as odd as it was and frustrating as it was, uh, it wasn't a terribly full house. Again, it's it's an area that we're trying to build, yeah. and, you know, but the band played great, played joyously, really gave those in the room. It was enough there that you could feel some energy back and they were very enthusiastic and very appreciative. It's a really good music area, a, a area that supports live music really well. Um, the people that were there and the friends of ours and fans of ours that came, you know, were supportive. And we had a small kind of private party kind of vibe to it. Oh, but nice. the band, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're coming off that five in a row stretch. We then had a rehearsal to prep some new songs for a big gig we have coming up this Saturday. And we not nailed five songs in one rehearsal. Um, we, uh, and then this gig where again, could have been a notch down disappointment and not playing for as many people, you know, all the weirdness, all the waiting around, which can often drain your energy, but the band played really, really well. And so, you know, a, a, another golden lining is I am struck with how dedicated to putting a great, experience out there for people my guys are they really every band says that i think and everybody I actually goes so far as to say every band intends that but when when weirdness floats your way it derails a lot of people in a you lot gotta, of ways yeah you got to get past it and it's not yeah. you can't always right i mean it it and in, in fact you almost never can fully but you have to find a way to pretend like it's not like the weirdness isn't there until, right. until, you know, it, it's that fake it till you make it kind of thing. Right. It's, it's it, the managing the weirdness works the same way. You just, you fake it till you make it. Um, this was like, you know, when we, we rehearse, we, we rehearse in a garage. It's a little bit of an odd setup. I mean, the rhythm section is kind of in a semicircle. The horns are kind of on the other end of the semicircle. Right. You know, not everything is mic'd real clearly. You know, we 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 get through our rehearsals, right? I, yeah, We're not like I, on a, I don't understand that. To be perfectly honest, like to me, the rehearsal room, it sh like it's to me, it would be worth spending the time of one rehearsal to get the rehearsal room set up so that it's always pristine in sound. I, I really think that is a like I can't even imagine dealing with rehearsing without getting it so that the rehearsal room should be where it sounds the best all the time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, I a great, it. a great, a great side subject that we probably should deal, you know, dive into about like, how is your rehearsal room set up? Cause yeah. there are a lot of things to think about. My point to this is, uh, this gig with the limited amount of sound reinforcement, the limited amount of mix and forcing everybody to kind of listen to each other. It, I was, I was struck with how determined my band was to get, understanding they were going to get the minimum they could, that they would usually have, but still really good listening, making do making the best of a bad situation and playing a really good show. That's, that's just makes you feel good as a leader that your band is that committed. There's not prima donnas, you know, there's not, there's not, you know, any kind of weirdness. The focus was on 
those X number of people in the audience, we were going to make sure that they had a good time. And that's, that's a it. very, very rewarding, fulfilling feeling to know that your band is all on that, all on that page, even in difficult situations. It's that shared crisis brings well, people that, together. To- that's mm-hmm. it. Right. And, and oftentimes, so we had, so I had four gigs since we spoke last, cause I had uh, an acoustic gig on Thursday night at the, at the gaslight deck in Portsmouth, which was great. It, perfect weather, uh, you know, like sound on stage was good. Sound in the house was good. Every, we just, it's a long gig cause it's four hours of acoustic music. So you really got to like the, a long one. the, the lesson that, that we've learned in doing these, cause with the, you know, with acoustic music, you can't really stretch songs out, right. You know, it's, it, it starts to get pretty boring. Uh, so, you know, it's basically four hours of singing and, um, what we found for those four hour gigs is to not cut the first set short like in fact to intentionally lengthen the first set so that you know we'll do like we played 7 to 11 so our first set ended at 8 30 and that way you're not stuck with the last set being this thing where you've got to just like pull teeth to you know mm-hmm. to find songs to play and to find the energy and all that stuff so so from that standpoint you know we, we've learned how to do it and it it works and usually it's only like the last 10 minutes of that first set if at all where you're like oh yeah we got to do a little more but you know but usually you find your wind and and it, that first set's easy and you're good to go and um so that gig went well and then i had midnight rocky horrors on Friday and Saturday nights, um, which both went really, really well, but it it was, it was weird for both of them. I, um, the, uh, you know, I've been playing a lot of rock gigs. It's been a while. It's been a month. Maybe it feels like more, but maybe it's only been a month, but I've had a lot of rock gigs in the middle there where, you know, I'm not reading music and I hadn't read Mm -hmm. music since, you know, my last Tommy performance. I think whenever that was, I just hadn't looked at sheet music. And the way Rocky Horror starts, it, the way we do it is, you know, we well, they first of all, they have a costume contest and we play like some, you know, 12 bar blues under that or whatever. Mm-hmm. And and then we wind up playing just a kind of a rock groove while they they do this call and response with the audience thing where everybody starts chanting, you know, Rocky, Rocky. And then from that, we segue right in to the first tune of the show. Um, and we were you know, in the first four bars of that first tune. So we're just playing and listening to each other. And then suddenly, you know, Julius counts us in. I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a surprise. We knew it was coming. It was like, okay, here we are. Right. Great. Top of uh, uh, science fiction, double feature, or whatever the name of the song is, you know? And I was like, Oh, right. Holy crap. I need to now start counting and thinking and, you know, Rocky's, I mean, Rocky's pretty easy. So you can feel your way through most of it. But I wouldn't trust myself to feel my way through the whole thing, you, you know. Mm. And so it was this this mind shift of, oh, right. I haven't thought about reading music in a, a month or more. And now I have to be reading like right away. I have to be reading music. So that was sort of a just an interesting transition to have to make. And then I had to make it again the, the next night um, because during the day and and some of the evening on Saturday, I played a wedding outside with uh, with Uptown Celebration. And I knew that the schedule would work to be able to uh, to to do this wedding and then and then go play Rocky Horror. In fact, the wedding was literally two blocks away from the theater where Rocky Horror was. So it, and it was outside. So Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire, has awful noise ordinances for outdoor music live. And so they they mm-hmm. shut things down. Um but, it, you know, it was interesting. So we, we, this, this wedding gig, similar things. It always seems like there's these, the, like you said, these shared crisis moments, but sometimes that can actually bring the band together and, and, you know, kind of, kind of create that camaraderie before you get on stage. So we get there and we find out initially we had a ten fifteen hard stop. Right. And we're getting to this, this gig at like one because we have to set up and then there's cocktail music to play and all that good stuff. But, um, it, you know, we get there and as soon as we get there, our band leader tells us, Oh yeah, by the way, I got a note this morning. Here's new set lists. Here's a new flow for the evening. We're, we're, uh, we need to end by nine 45. <laughs> it's like, okay, well that no problem. Like I, you know, now I, that just bought me a half hour of extra time to make it across the street to the theater to play, you know, Rocky Horror. Great. No problem. Mm-hmm. And, uh, 
And and so we start setting up and that's fine. Everything's, you know, going well. And and we have you have a bill. We have a Dave, not me, Dave, our our sound guy, Dave Albetsky. He's uh, he's it, it's just like what you have with Bill. Right. I mean, it you know, he covers everything. He's a bass player, too. He's actually a really good bass player. So, you know, he, he approaches everything really musically and he understands like what we go through on stage and he's always making sure everything's good. So, you know, he's there doing his thing. We're all doing our thing together. And uh, Dave comes up and he's like, oh, by the way, I just talked to, you know, the local who, whomever. And they uh, they said we need to, you know, really tone it down starting at nine o'clock. It's like, well, <laughs> that starts to get interesting. OK, fine. Whatever. We don't care. You know, like not only had the check already cleared, but, you know, we had already been paid like it was it was done. You know, it's like, OK, well, whatever. This isn't this isn't our choice anymore. Fine. So we get set up. Um, we had a blast playing cocktail music. Uh, they they um, I found this to be. Oftentimes it, on Saturday, it wasn't, we actually had a lot of fun playing the set, but oftentimes the, the, the hour or whatever that we play, what's called cocktail music is, it can be the most fun because we can play whatever we want and we'll play like, you know, we played some Steely Dan tunes. We played, you know, we've oh, we played Brandy, the looking glass tune. We played some Beatles singing songs. it or just instrumental. Yeah, no singing it too. I would, I play like brushes on my, on my kit or whatever, but, um, but, you know, it's basically just us hanging out on stage, making music while people are mm -hmm. drinking and not really paying attention. Some people, you know, wander over to the stage or whatever. But for the most part, we're just wallpaper, which is which is fun because we get to just do whatever. We, we don't have to be on. We can just, you know, enjoy. And uh, and then so we end the cocktail music at at six o'clock and uh, we're walking towards we were we, we were told we were eating in like in a room inside or something, which is great. So we're walking in the the organizer of the event uh, happens to, you know, be there as we're walking by and, and Gary, the leader of the band says, uh, cool. He's like, well, uh, now that we're finished with cocktail music, we're going to go do what we do best. And she says, oh, socialize and mingle. And he said, no, eat, you know, because it was six o'clock. We had to be on stage by 715. Yep. And her comment was, oh, it's going to be a while for that. And it's like, oh, Okay. So we go inside and, uh, you know, we're kind of sussing things out. We check the caterers had just gotten there. They were way behind. And the thing is, man, I don't know how many of these types of gigs you do, but this kind of delay happens almost every time. And it, it, it astounds me because there is a, always a hard stop on these events. Either the venue has a stop or in this case, you know, the, the, the local town has a stop, but you know, it's, it's not like you could just go till four in the morning if you want, you, you know, there's, there's a lot of people and a lot of thing, a lot of moving parts and this thing shall end at its end time, no matter what happens leading up to that. And it's like, okay, so, you know, like they're just barely cooking. The guests haven't really even had appetizers yet. Like this is really, really slow. Right. And, uh, and it's like, yeah, all right, fine. So, you know, we're backstage and, uh, whatever, and, you know, chit chat and, watching this thing develop we're like okay well we might only get one set in okay well that's fine and gary's like no we're definitely taking a break he's like mm. we have it contracted that we have a break we're gonna take a break it's like all right gary well you know whatever you you you're the boss you run the show it's fine and but we did like things worked out and we actually made it uh on stage by maybe about 7 40 7 45 and we did wind up taking a break we played two sets it, it you know it worked out well and the band played so, I mean, we were relaxed. We were, you know, everybody was, could hear the, the crowd was so appreciative and enthusiastic. That nice. it, yeah. That it just, you know, it was like, like you said, you get this frustrating thing that sort of starts boiling up and we're a little bit stressed backstage thinking, well, you know, we got to get out there and play, but these people aren't ready for us. We're not ready. We haven't eaten. We've been here all day. Like, you know, we got to do something here, but it's out of our, it's out of our hands is really what so, it is, you know, at that point. Yeah. So I think your story comes back right around to my story. So I, the deal is this, the temptation, certainly, certainly my temptation is to, is to not go with the flow and be ready to do battle because our agreement said this. Right. Right. It really doesn't make any sense. And so, you know, figuring out how you can you know, yeah, get past that. Yes. Well, get past it. And again, to still enjoy doing the gig, 
because you know, that's what you're doing. Again, you know, there, and again, there's different levels of people who listen to the show. There's, there's a hardcore professional, like this is what I do. This is the hours. This is our agreement. I'm going to follow the agreement. You're going to follow agreement. And you know, if you don't follow your part of it, that's not my problem. Or if it is my problem, don't expect me to adapt to your problem. Right. That's one headspace to approach these types of things. Thinking back on mine, the, the, anxiety I felt creeping as the evening felt like it was going to get away. Cause again, yes. you start projecting, it's all going to start going bad. You know, it's going to be terrible. We're not going to be able to hear, we're not going to play well. You know, the band's going to be pissed off at each other. All the things that you, that you start projecting, there's a healthy middle ground of going with the flow. That is probably just a great life tool for being a music. It's probably a great life tool for anything, for anything. But a good life tool no, that, for being a musician. For that's sure. That's Totally. What this was, was like, once we got on stage and we're halfway through the first set, it's like, you know, what in the heck were we worried about 20 minutes ago? Like this, this is totally fine. These people are happy. Like it's all good. Everything's good. It's fine. You know, yeah. that's it. It's just fine. Don't worry about it. Yep. Yeah. Everything's so, awesome. Yeah. How to go with the flow. I mean, it doesn't mean that you, you know, go with the flow. If the guy says start two hours late, but I want you to play two hours later, you you know, there's, there's also a life skill and politely saying, no, 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 you know, I'm sorry. I can't do that. You know, right. and take a tone that doesn't have to be, you know, confrontational or, or as confrontational as you're comfortable being. But, but once you get that temperature level going up, that will probably cascade into other aspects of the evening including your performance, including, you know, your yes. band, you know, a, a, and again, people, people internalize that stuff. So, you know, in my band, I know I've got some guys who are fiercely defensive of me, right? So if they see me upset, they're going to get upset. Yep. I have guys who want no part of drama whatsoever. And so, you know, they're kind of pre-programmed to avoid any kind of, you know, kind, but this will get into everybody's head. So I it think does, it does, even the, even the guys that don't react to it outwardly, it gets it. Like you said, it gets into everybody's head for sure. Yeah, and yeah. and your, your performance is less than what it could be. Yep. And that's what you want to avoid. Yep. Yep. And, and, you know, as it turned out for you and it turned out for us, like once you, once you get on stage and you're playing, it's like, oh yeah, this is fine. The people yeah, are happy. Absolutely. No, most of these guests, yeah, their dinner was delayed too. Right. I mean, you know, because we ate after them, which also was sort of weird. That was part of the frustration. It was like, wait a minute. Uh, you know, I get that you've got guests out there, but if you want us playing, as they're finishing, you know, right as they're finishing dinner, you should probably feed us first. Like no one needs to know except us that we're able to get on stage. You know, nobody needs to know how the sausage is made, but you want to yep. make the sausage the right way. So that was sort so of frustrating. It, you know, it was like, well, they, we can't feed you before the guests. It's like, oh, yeah, but OK, I, I, I get that mentality. I understand we're not as important as the guests. However, for the guests enjoyment, you want us in spot A at time B. Let's think about the right way to organize things to get us there. Yeah. And, but that's, that's the thing is you just got to get past it. And these were great yeah. people. You, you know, I'll, I'll end this. It's, it's, it's funny doing these weddings. You never, well, you know, when the wedding's booked, you don't, you have no idea what the people are going to be like and what the crowd's going to be like, or, you know, it could, and some of these things get really stuffy and it's, you know, almost uncomfortable, but you still cash the check and walk away because people spend way too much money on many on weddings. It's ridiculous. But, um, but with these people, you know, and with everybody, you get the three songs that you have to learn, or they've asked you to learn for the thing. And their three songs are often very informative as to how the evening's going to go. And these three were, Dancing in the Moonlight by King Harvest, Michelle by the Beatles, and Southern Cross by Cros Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And it was like, okay, we're playing for a bunch of stoners. Like, this is going to mm. be fine. And, it's all good. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to, and sure enough, we got, we started the second set and man, underneath that tent smelled like a fish show. Our bass player turned to me. He's like, okay, cool. At this point, we can do no wrong. He's like, these people are in the palms of our hands. <laughs> then sure it. enough. Yeah, it's right. It, everybody was having fun. It was great. So take a chill pill, go with the flow. You may surprise yourself. Yeah, that's it. That's the, uh, that's the lesson is, and, and, I've learned that lesson many times. I was still really stressed about the schedule because it's just how I am. And it's, you know, I, it, it would be good not to get that way, but I don't know. I guess you just learn how to get on stage and play anyway. That's the real trick. Yep. Yep. <sighs> you got anything else for today, man? I'm good, man. Good, right. Glad to get that off my chest. Yeah. Good. Yeah. This was, uh, it's, it's always fun playing. So, you know, and, uh, for me, it was a good distraction to take, you know, we dropped our daughter off at, at college for her freshman year on Friday. And then uh, 
I had, you know, three gigs right in a row. And my wife actually uh, ushered the two Rocky Horrors at midnight. So she was out there with us and that was good. You know, so nice distraction for the weekend. So it's good. Onward we go. Onward we go. All right, folks. Well, that's what we got. That's what we got. Remember, giggabpodcast.com. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Please send us an email. Tell us what you think. Tell us your tactics for getting past those kinds of crazy things that happen in the lead up to taking the stage. What is it we say, Paul? I say it. You say it. Everybody should say it. Always be performing.